Okay, uh, warm, warm welcome to this seminar around bioenergy and the role that uh, wood and the global forest can play in a more sustainable world. Please take your seat and we're going to start the program. My name is Pontus Hirin. I work for uh, Dagens Industri as a reporter and also host for their TV channel. This is a joint venture between Elmia Wood and Dagens Industri, if anyone had missed that. So happy to see so many people here today. Find your way here. I'm not entirely surprised because we have a very interesting program for the next almost two hours with a lot of authorities within an expert within this area is going to be on stage. Also, of course, a hot topic and a very up-to-date and important topic to speak about. As you all know, I mean, global forests plays a big role and can probably play an even bigger role to, uh, for, for a better climate and a better world in, in many ways, of course, as uh, reducing the uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere while by binding it in the trees and the soil, for one sake. And also, obviously, that wood can replace many other materials with a higher climate impact. Um, Sweden is said to have a leading global role in this with uh, very innovative companies and also, in many ways, maybe a good policies with a long-term view of our forests. Uh, Correct or not correct, I don't know, but if it's so, can we take advantage of that in anyhow? Uh, that's one of the most important questions we're going to talk about today. And also, okay, uh, of course, we're going to recognize some trends among uh, sustainable forestry and uh, bioenergy in different ways. We're going to do that with the panel. So, as a keynote speaker, we have Mr. Douglas Faulkner with uh, two decades. Uh, uh, an expert on bioenergy from a, from a global perspective, you can say. Very much looking forward to that. We're going to follow up his speech with a panel with, uh, uh, I think, a total of six persons here. But first, I want to exchange some words with, with Lotta Frensen, CEO of Elmia. Welcome up on stage. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So, uh, Lot Lotta, uh, first day yesterday, Elmia Wood yes. this year. Mm -hmm. What's your impression? Uh, Elmia Wood is a very special show or an event for Elmia, uh, not least since it's a trade show conducted in the middle of the forest. So anything can happen. Yesterday was pretty hot, pretty warm, but still a lot of visitors, of course. Is that and good or bad? It's, it's, uh, it's, I mean, if you like heat, it's good. <laughs> uh, if you like rain, it was better 2017. So, I mean, it, it all depends. But if you do something, you should do it all the way. So we had very hot weather. It's a little bit milder today, so I think that will be good. Uh, we have uh, approximately 300 exhibitors uh, from over 20 nations and also over 60 accredited journalists at the show. So we're happy about that. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the, the reason why we have this Elmia Wood uh, with global attention is due to the root. It's so deeply rooted in the forestry know-how from this region. Uh, and that's also very important. It must be a big challenge having this big trade show out in the woods. <laughs> yes, but I, I mean, it's the team, of course. We have yeah. so many extremely talented and hardworking uh, girls and guys working here to, to set this up. And it's been planned for so long. So. And it seems this year that what you, you'd like to point out, are there any trends you recognize among the exhibitors? Uh, yeah, it's of course the big global questions, issues, challenges like uh, wildfires and, and bugs in the forestry. But the key thing is of course the innovations and the startup companies uh, coming here to try to market maybe new innovations to see does this uh, is, is that sustainable to market? Is it not? Does it need adaptions? And so it's a lot of new things coming here, being tested here, being exhibited here. And then, of course, based on that also to see how could that drive the industry going forward in terms of change. And when this is over, you start planning two years ahead, 2021, of wh course. what can we expect then? Uh, you can expect a global forestry fair with, again, the, the global community as a global meeting place for forestry. 
uh, with a lot of new innovations, of course, driving the, the industry forward. Uh, people will come here with experiences and they will conduct business development and drive forward. Okay, good luck with that work. Thank you. Th and thank you for arranging this uh, seminar, not at least. Um, Lotta mentioned innovation, that's of course is a thread today in the seminar that we're going to listen to. But now, uh, as I said, 20 years more experience of uh, bioenergy, global perspective, uh, not at least as an advisor of some of the top level American politicians. Uh, also a member, board of director member in the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce, so a good view on the development in Sweden as well. Also the founder of Leather Stocking Clean Technology Strategic Advisory Firm. Please welcome Mr. Douglas Faulkner. Well, thank you, Pontus. Um, it's great to be back in Sweden, and I love getting out of the city and smelling this country air again. Um, I do have to note that it's a, it's a pretty unique setting for me. I mean, for all these decades of public speaking, I, I've never had an audience of humans and animals before, so I'll, I'll try and uh, not to say anything to upset the farmer's cows. Uh, I'm a son of the soil from a very small village in Illinois, on the Illinois prairie. I grew up surrounded by farms, and I worked in the fields from a very early age. I have a deep love and affinity for those who have dirt under their fingernails, as we say, and those that work with their hands to grow and make things. That personal background and my over two decades uh, in green energy color my remarks here today. You could say I was present at the creation of modern bioenergy in America, which really began in earnest in the late 1990s. I started in bioenergy helping the leaders of the Clinton administration build a new initiative for bio-based products that's using crops, trees, and waste to make um, chemicals and consumer goods like plastics, paints, adhesives, lubricants, and even now cosmetics instead of petroleum. After the passage of our landmark Biomass Research and Development Act of 2000, what we call in the government the Bible for federal uh, bioenergy efforts, I led a presidential initiative in the George W. Bush administration to expand the use of cellulose and lignin for transportation fuels. And then after leaving government in the Obama administration, I started my own clean technology company. Capping all of that, uh, the US Secretaries of Energy and Agriculture last summer, my old departments, uh, named me the co-chair of the Biomass Research and Development Technical Advisory Committee, that's kind of a long title, for a congressionally authorized group tasked with giving independent advice to the federal government. The government has many bioenergy offices and programs and they're trying to implement this nationally designated priority. I should note that of all the green energy stuff, renewables and energy efficiency, bioenergy is the only one that has been given this designation by Congress as a national initiative, national priority. So this new assignment takes me full circle back in my career because as a senior political leader, I helped to create this group and I built its federal oversight body. And so now I'm on the, what we say, on the other side of the table as a volunteer private citizen. In my short time as this group's new leader, um, I proposed and the committee approved my initial plan of action. We first addressed bio-based products, research and development. Second, we reviewed government regulations uh, preventing the growth of advanced biofuels. That was a fairly controversial action. And then launched an effort for 2019 for an intensive look at the forests of the future and their opportunities for bioenergy, what I dubbed the year of the tree, which the press kind of liked that. Um, I should note that um, our actions dovetail well with the Trump administration's uh, efforts to focus on regulatory reform. We have publicly released three sets of recommendations. They can be found at biomassboard.gov. We're taking a site visit in a few weeks to the American Northwest, out to Montana, followed probably by another later in the summer to the Southeast, uh, North Carolina or Georgia. Two very different geographies, two very different cultures, economies, and of course, trees. And we think that will give us a pretty good national perspective on this subject. Uh, Lata invited me here today to share some of my perspectives with you and look to future prospects for using trees for energy. But first, let me take a minute and explain the name of my company, Leather Stocking LLC. That might be confusing to a foreign audience. The, the name takes its name and inspiration from the uh, great early American frontier fiction series, The Leather Stocking Tales by James Fenimore Cooper. 
Um, many of you may know it from its most famous book, and it's been in movies, The Last of the Mohicans. Uh, much of the series' earliest action takes place in the great primeval American forest in the American colonial period. I kind of draw parallels with the hero for blazing pathways through the clean tech and government wilderness. We're partnered here in uh, Scandinavia with Christina Hellenius of Nordic West Office. Our goal is to give our clients uh, the access and visibility in North America for you to succeed. So, first slide. Good news, bad news. There was an ad for women's cigarettes in my youth whose catchy slogan was, you've come a long way, baby. Well, that can certainly be said for bioenergy. The International Energy Agency uh, recently stated that modern bioenergy is a, quote, an overlooked giant. In 2017, half of all renewable energy came from bioenergy, more than all hydro, wind, and solar combined more than all hydro, wind, and solar combined. And we'll have the biggest growth of renewable energy, renewable resources for the next several years. By 2023, bioenergy will account for 30% of that growth from solid, liquid, and gaseous fuels for heating and transportation, where other renewables still have a very small impact. The IEA sees bioenergy as a, what they call a, quote, blind spot, issues that are critical to the evolution of the whole global energy sector, and given far less attention than they deserve. Nevertheless, despite that legacy of overall progress, modern or advanced bioenergy still remains just a tiny sliver of the whole bioenergy category. In America, first-generation biofuels has been a real success story. Big news for farming, the farming community. Cornstarch ethanol has hit the maximum allowed under the mandate, the Renewable Fuel Standard mandate, and the and uh, the president has just announced expanding that by year-round sales of E15, in other words, 15% ethanol blended with gasoline. Soy biodiesel has expanded rapidly, too. Meanwhile, though, the stated policy goal of growing the next generation of fuels, chemicals, heat, and power from non-food, waste, and residue sources remains only a vision of what it could be in America. For example, there are only five facilities funded and under design or construction in all of North America for converting trees to fuels, Canada and America. The biggest hindrance to growth, I believe, are those onerous regulations that I mentioned earlier. The IEA publicly projects that renewable energy development overall in the heat, electricity, and transport sectors has to accelerate, and very soon. The shares of these renewable resources including bioenergy, otherwise will be far, far lower than they could be, and most importantly, need to be, to meet long-term sustainability and climate goals. There just ain't enough bioenergy, especially advanced in the pipeline. Excuse me for a minute. Bioenergy is a complicated story. One overlooked factor and the gap between potential and reality, I think, is a difficulty in telling bioenergy's real story. It's good news story. This has greatly contributed to the, what I call the lost decade, when for the last 10 years, unrelenting attacks in the press and misinformation from bioenergy's opponents have stalled its momentum, undermining public support, while politicians have focused more on green electricity and electric vehicles. It's really hard to fit this story into a media soundbite or a, like an elevator pitch to a policymaker. Bioenergy involves a multitude of current and future feedstocks grown or thrown away on the land or from the sea. They can be put through a range of industrial processes and equipment to make an incredible collection of not just transportation fuels, but also industrial products like cement and consumer goods, like I mentioned earlier. Early biofuels, uh, when I was working on it, targeted civilian personal vehicles, but demand from airlines, ocean shipping, heavy road transport, as well as from the militaries around the world are really growing. For example, some estimate a doubling in demand for air travel in the next 20 years. This means a really complicated intersection between agriculture, forestry, chemical, transportation, and energy sectors at least. Bioenergy production and use has been dominated by the U.S. and Brazil, followed by the EU. But new players, new markets are emerging globally very fast. So watch rising Indian and Chinese conglomerates in Africa, South and Southeast Asia. Canada, with its vast forest, may be its own sleeping giant in the trees to energy saga. 
Bioenergy is thus subject to an important but ever more complex sustainability regime. Many still think of sustainability as only relating to its impact on food supplies or carbon emissions, but it's clearly so very much more. For example, the Global Bioenergy Partnership, what the bureaucracy calls GBEP, part of the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, was started during the Bush administration, finalized during Obama's. I, I helped lead that involvement in partnership with our friends in Brazil. We insisted that bioenergy was sustainable, and to prove that contention, we needed metrics and indicators set by experts, not politicians, based on science, not emotions or slogans, and all publicly available, not hidden away, only accessible to a few. We argued for measuring a wide range of social, economic, as well as a bunch of environmental factors. The final 24 indicators have been field tested and constitute a fundamental tool for national policymakers for sustainable development. By the way, Sweden has headed this particular effort for several years. You can see that at globalbioenergy.org. Bioenergy's many benefits can make a lot of sense to voters. All too often, national elites, I think, forget that the real impact on human, forget the real impact on humans in setting policies that would effectively raise overall cost or reduce supplies of energy. Witness our recent Green New Deal hullabaloo, uh, which never even mentioned bioenergy, incredibly, but advocated a massive expansion of government. The poor and the middle classes, especially in rural areas, I think, need hope that their lives can be improved through sustainability. Part of my message is bioenergy can be a force, can be a force for good. Time for change. My friend Bob McNally wrote in his salient book, Crude Volatility, that we are in for an extended period, many years, of wide fluctuations of oil prices, up and down. There is no longer a swing producer like the old Texas Railroad Commission to vary production to stabilize prices. But in a world awash in oil and gas, old-style geopolitical threats to oil supplies paradoxically appear to be growing. Witness the flashpoints near oil fields or ocean shipping lanes in the Middle East, Venezuela, or in the South China Sea. Military clashes or escalated unrest at any of these places could destabilize oil markets on which so much of the world will, yes, continue to depend for two or three more decades at least. Simultaneously, the world's climate is warming and changing, much of which is caused by mankind's modern lifestyles. The scope of this problem means we need massive changes on a lot of fronts, especially in the lagging industrial and transport sectors. Meanwhile, another global environmental crisis is brewing too in our rivers and oceans, but given far less attention, I think. Mind-jarring amounts of petroplastic waste are building up very fast, threatening global food and water supplies. The Washington Post recently reported on scientists discovering over 400 million, 400 million pieces of waste plastic on a tiny island in the Indian Ocean. And evidence is mounting that that's far from an isolated sighting. The World Economic Forum estimates by 2050, plastic wastes in oceans will outweigh the fish in them. It's kind of hard to get in your head. Will outweigh the fish. By the way, electric vehicles are heavily dependent on petrol plastics to keep their weight down. I read that by 2020, the average EV will use almost 800 pounds of plastics in each car in hundreds of parts. And then you have to recycle it. The world's population continues to grow, adding billions more souls before plateauing in the middle of this century. That growth is basically coming from the developing world where their desire for better lives will strain conventional resources in the environment. Their demand for more food, more feed, more fiber, more fuels, more jobs, and a better life will explode in the decades ahead. Bright lights over the horizon. This is my last slide. But it's not, I don't want, don't want to leave you with the impression, it's not a bleak and forlorn future by any means. I wrote in the e-publication Biofuels Digest that the world needs more bioenergy but just doesn't know it yet. While international experts at the IEA and elsewhere broadcast their conclusions, policymakers, the press, and the public 
They don't really know that biofuels are the only commercially available alternative to oil that can reduce greenhouse gases from transportation in the short to medium term, as well as ensure against catastrophic oil supplies, oil shocks, boost traditional industries like pulp and paper, and help to modernize developing world's agricultural sectors. Bio-based products also have a golden opportunity to expand production of biodegradable plastics and other consumer goods or to help recycle existing waste. Every single day, there's a new story about new companies or their amazing new products and plants. And consumers, I think, especially the young, are ready to open their pocketbooks for innovative products with demonstrably lower carbon and environmental footprints. Bioenergy's kind of back to the future qualities can capture the popular imagination. But we need a concerted global approach, more collaborative research across the whole value chain, more encouragement of entrepreneurship, more private-public partnerships, more acceptances by environmental groups, more market growth of sustainable products, especially in developing countries, and more global champions with consistent, clear messages. Each one of those topics, I think, is worthy of deeper discussion, but are certainly achievable. I believe that media communications will be the most critical task. The public and politicians everywhere need to hear over and over and over again that trees are one of nature's key blessings to the planet and an abundant resource for humankind that can be used responsibly. Sustainability certification regimes are now taking root and they can help in public persuasion. The raw materials, the basic feedstocks for these new industries are clearly available and clearly sustainable, especially wood for energy. In the US, we're taking a new look at opportunities for woody bioenergy and our drive for healthier and safer forest. People were really scared by the California forest fires last year and kind of woke up to some new realities. There is new interest from both Democrats and Republicans for re-examining forest management practices frozen for the last several decades, which have probably actually increased the odds of forest fires and hindered progress against invasive insects. President Trump and California's new Democratic Governor Newsom each have issued executive actions. The President called upon his Secretaries of the Interior and Agriculture to actively manage our national forests to improve conditions, reduce unnecessary fuel loads, and reduce fire risk wildfire risk. He emphasized new actions to enhance biomass and biochar opportunities. In Congress, members from both parties are expressing similar interest. Last spring, funding legislation signed by the President contained congressional direction and emphasis of the U.S. forest sector to the nation's energy needs. It was pretty explicit, pretty amazing. Specifically, Congress directed departments of energy and agriculture as well as the regulators, the Environmental Protection Agency, to establish clear and simple policies that reflect the carbon neutrality, that's out of the law, carbon neutrality of forest bioenergy, encourage private investment through the forest biomass supply chain, and encourage better forest management. Those agencies later publicly agreed with that, noting that their interagency approaches will be guided by an appreciation that forests are managed to provide multiple benefits, including energy and detailed their action, and who says nothing works in Washington. Recently, senators from Oregon, Idaho, and Maine introduced a bipartisan bill to reform the, ma the current mandate to allow biomass from certain federal lands for advanced biofuels. If passed, it will change current legal roadblocks to the use of trees from federal property from those fuels. The, Federal government owns almost half of all lands west of the Mississippi. The bill would generate new opportunities to use small diameter trees, limbs, hazardous fuels, debris, and even mill sawdust to create new fuels and lower, lower risk. It also explicitly protects old growth trees on federal property, and that's a key environmental concern. My advisory committee issued a detailed set of recommendations about reforming the renewable fuel standard to open up markets for advanced biofuels with a particular focus on unleashing the woody biofuel sector. We will also devote our last meeting this year to a summary of our findings for changes in the government's research policies and regulations to promote woody bioenergy sustainably as, as better, safer and better and safer forest management practices become a reality. 
We particularly want to draw on experiences from other countries to enrich our advice. I will take back with me lessons I've learned at this fair and in meeting with exciting Swedish biomass companies, um, like our friend here in the front row, Mr. Enso. My experiences during the Bush administration promoting international collaboration for bioenergy uh, gave me a very strong, very favorable impression of Sweden's consistent support for bioenergy. I've always very much appreciated that. I've learned much since about the leading Swedish role in modern forest management. In Canada, the private sector is finally making its voice heard. The Bioindustrial Innovation Canada recently released that country's first national bioeconomy strategy and called on their nation's capital to develop its own for the country. More than 400 industry reps, representatives recommended action to their government on four priority areas, creating agile regulation and government uh, policy, establishing biomass supply and stewardship, building strong companies and value chains, and building sustainable innovation systems, ecosystems. The strategy focuses on commercializing innovations to grow larger companies and to have Canadian products and processes adopted into the global value chain. The recent announcement of a new factory capable of processing 100 million tons of pulp and paper biomass into woody bioenergy, woody bio-based products, I think is a signal of that country's potential. Friends, the world is once again on a pathway for expanded use of trees and other biological sources for an, a sustainable energy future. I believe that we are on the verge of realizing my old boss, President Bush's dream of ending our addiction to oil and ushering in a golden age of bioenergy. I think it's high time to unleash our foresters, scientists, engineers, and entrepreneurs. There's a lot of work to be done and the clock's a ticking. How fast we get there, at what cost, and who the winners and losers will be are all yet to be determined. That's out in the future, in this complex and fast-moving international saga. Ultimately, the sustainability of Woody Bioenergy will be won by solid science, business success, and open public debate over many years. Sweden clearly has a leadership role to play, and that's why Elmia Wood 2021 will be such a critical milestone in this global journey. Thank you for having me today. Th thank you very much, uh, Douglas. Very interesting. The cows are quiet, <laughs> listening carefully, too. The, the uh, farmer will be happy. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious. It seems to, to a conclusion, what you're saying is that potential in the U.S. is huge. Finally, the politician starts recognizing what's going on and the potential. What would you say is the, 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 the most driving forces here? Is the, the voters uh, that, uh, or from maybe the rural areas, or is it the industry that's pushing this forward, or is it just the world agreements, such as the Paris Agreement, uh, the go global goals? Or what, what's the most important driving forces here? I think it's a complicated story. I think it's a lot of things that you mentioned. Um, I think when a little digression, when I was building the my bio-based products program uh, in the Clinton administration, part of my job was to go out in rural areas and give talks like this in, in, in uh, interesting settings. And um, I was always, I, I was always pleased to see that um, uh, voters and citizens out there in very obscure places really were interested in this topic. I think when you give farmers and foresters a chance for new markets, that's a, that's a powerful force for change. Um, you know, you also have to change um, mindsets. You have to convince people that there's, um, uh, there are these opportunities and that the bioenergy is positive, is exciting because I think there's been so many years of bad information and the, um, it, you have to, you're kind of swimming upstream against the current. But I think it will, you know, over time, because of some of the things I mentioned, uh, become the, the both parties are starting to slowly realize, you know, if they can stop fighting amongst themselves, starting to realize that there are great opportunities there. Okay. Um, but, but I guess when it comes to the, the industry, I, I guess they also use their uh, power in, in sort of lobbying power skills and also they have to compete against that. We, we all read about the, the, the growing shale oil industry in the U.S. Mm. and their um, also powerful lobby organization. Sure, is, sure. is it like a fight between that, that uh, to have the politi political ears? Uh, 
Well, there's lots of fights going on yeah. in Washington <laughs> right now. Of course. <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to get above the noise. We have a presidential election and 24 people running for the nomination on the Democratic side and Mr. Yeah. Trump, and so that, uh, that takes a lot of the air out of a room. But, um, but this shale yeah, oil industry, are they sort of uh, um, working against this development when it comes to, to more no, forest I, I, and bioenergy? Um, some of the most interesting fights are between big agriculture and big oil because um, you know, the basic uh, uh, cornstarch ethanol um, is taking market share from the oil industry. Um, but I think if policymakers and, and the public, uh, wh one of the things I've learned in the energy business in uh, energy politics in America is that frequently people don't pay attention to it unless you have to pay attention to it. Like there's a crisis, you know, we have war in the Persian Gulf or in the South China Sea, and then oil supplies get cut and everybody looks around and says, well, uh oh, now what do we do kind of thing. Um, if things are going okay, it's hard to, it's hard to talk about change. But, so I view, I view bioenergy as a big insurance policy, too, and for, for think bad things that can happen. But, you know, there, there's lots of reasons why bioenergy, and I'm not here to point fingers or be a negative person, but I talked a lot about the message, I think, um, you know, there are in, in the environmental community, uh, there are some that maybe see this as bio, uh, bioenergy as a negative. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's the uh, electric vehicle people who are fighting against bioenergy. So there's a lot of different angles. It's not, I, I think it's, it's too, uh, not to, I'm not criticizing you. Not, it's too simplistic to say it's oil versus bioenergy. There's a lot of different moving pieces to okay. it. Okay. Um, you said that it was has been a lot of misunderstanding and maybe misinformation. You, would you say it's better now? Is it more uh, when you listen to politicians and also scientists? Would you say that uh, we have come come a long way when it comes to correct information and that? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say we're at the very early stages okay. of starting <laughs> to turn that thing around. Um, okay. um, I mean, the people that like ethanol like ethanol but in terms of the general general perceptions um i think we have a, a long way to go you know we've only just begun in this i was just curious when it comes to the industry i mean uh, looking in the history one thing to learn is it's maybe not always what the politicians want to do it's the industry that's driving changes uh, what 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 about the pulp and paper industry for example in the us do, do they see a great potential here like a uh, future export uh, products, et cetera? Well, that's a very good question. Um, pul the pulp and paper industry has been on a steady decline in the United yeah. States, maybe like yeah. other places in the world, as people are using less paper than, you know, newspapers are collapsing. And um, But I think uh, they got excited about this, this topic 10 years or so ago, and then the market shifted and they maybe got burned by that. So I think... Um, Again, that's another area where they, they, they see it. I've talked to pulp and paper companies and forestry, uh, forestry companies, and you know, they're, they're eager to hear about it, but people, people want to wait and see if real change is underway. So there's a potential there. Okay. F finally, we're going to start the panel soon. I'm, I'm just curious, your role in the, in, in, as a member of the Board of Directors of the Swedish American Chamber of Commerce. I, I mean, love that job. Uh, you love the job? <laughs> and a part of that job, obviously, for that uh, Chamber of Commerce is to help Swedish company getting into the U.S. in a different way. Within this specific area, uh, what, what's your advice? What, what, what important question are, are you driving here? What do you say to those Swedish companies that asks you? I'd say that there are lots of opportunities in America. There are lots, it's a, it's a complicated marketplace. The politics are complicated, but don't be scared by that. Be in it for the long haul and uh, the long, the long term and, um, look for markets where you can grow. I think the, the, the one thing that I've always been pleased about and I'm kind of amazed by about is when I hear, uh, I read public opinion polls, Swedish, the Swedish brand is very highly rated. Americans in general think highly of Swedish companies and Swedish products. So you start off from a very good place, I think, but then um, don't be afraid to jump over the pond and put your toe in the, that water over there. Okay. Very interesting to listen to you. And uh, please stay on the stage here because you're gonna join the, the panel. They're gonna start all uh, right, all soon. Right. You, you can just switch your place to, right, to right, behind right. here maybe. And uh, 
very interesting. Uh, also, I can recommend an article the Dagens Industry actually wrote about uh, what's going on in the US with, with Mr. Dockner Faulkner was one of the interviewed people. And I think maybe that's part of the reason why he's here today. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, you're nodding, you're nodding your head. It was a good <laughs> picture, too. Anne. It's a good picture. Okay. <laughs> Look at the picture as well. Okay, uh, I'd say welcome to the panel. Uh, I introduce you one on one. Let's start with uh, Alan Sherard. Uh, Editor-in-Chief, Bioenergy International. You're going to tell the audience what that is, but it's, uh, it's a media publication with okay. in this industry. Please please take your stand there. <laughs> Daniel Bodman, he Head of Public yeah. Affairs, Dorenzo. Welcome to you, too. Um, <laughs> Henrik Dernegård, uh, energy expert, Södra, one of the very, very big forest company here in <laughs> south of Sweden. <laughs> Oh, we start with the guys, I, I recognize I was not planned. <laughs> Helena Jonsson, <laughs> the governor of John Shopping's Land is here too. Very welcome to you too. Maybe I'll scoot over to break it up. Yes, okay. yes, please. And um, finally, Helena Jons, no, Johanna Mossberg, RISE, Research Institutes of Sweden. Welcome to you too. Uh, maybe you can a little bit more closer together so everyone uh, has room. Okay. Uh, you all know Douglas by now, so let's start with you instead, uh, Johanna uh, Rice. Tell us what you're doing there and what Rice is doing for, the, for those who don't know. Yes. Rice, for those of you that don't know, is the research institute of Sweden. That was previously a bunch of different research institutes. We are now one Rice, and we work together with the Swedish industry and uh, also public partners to help them innovate and make a transition journey. And at RISE, I work as the focus area manager of the area of fossil-free transport. And I should also mention that I have a part-time position at LTU, the university up in the northern part of Sweden. So quite delicate decisions also is what niches you're going to put your money in when it comes to the scientific research within this area, I guess. Yes, I would say that uh, dedicated niches, but also since it's innovation, you should not put all your money on one egg, yeah. so to say. Part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, Helena, um, bef before you were actually the chair chairman of LRF, so you know a lot about this industry, but now governor of the region, John Shopping. Yes, that's right. Um, I'm, uh, I'm the regional governor here, and I've been that for about one and a half year. And before that, as you say, I, I was the, uh, the president of the Federation of Swedish Farmers. So I have a, a big interest in these kind of questions personally. Um, and in my um, current, uh, current role, I'm also the chief of the, the county administrative board. And uh, this county is one of the, the most important regions for, for forestry in Sweden. So, uh, of course, this is a big issue for, for the, the board, too. And you actually made a forestry plan as one of the first regions, yes, right? Yes, yes. Uh, together with the the other counties in in uh, this uh, very f forest uh, forest region, we have uh, actually before the national one. So, is there an uh, overall discussion going on uh, th that the region should have more uh, to say about forest in general in in Sweden? Um, is is it like a no, no. I, I'd say it's um, a few different levels, of course. Uh, first, uh, first you have the, the forest owners. They have a big say in how they uh, manage the, the forest. Um, then we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, the regions and the national uh, legislation. But we also have uh, the European Union, who, who starts to be more and more interesting in in Sweden, Sweden and the northern Scandinavian forest uh, land, okay. I'd say. Bioenergy International, Alan, w what is that? Uh, well, I, I'm the cat amongst the pigeons here, I think. <laughs> uh, for, for two reasons. Uh, one is uh, I'm very familiar with Jönköping and very familiar with, with Elmia, since I had a position here many years ago uh, with this particular uh, fair. Uh, my background, I'm Irish, uh, an Irish Swede. Uh, came to Sweden um, looking for mini brunettes and blondines, forestry machines for those of you who don't know. <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's my, my background. I then, uh, after a couple of years ago, moved to the uh, media side of things. 
publication by Energy International. It's, it's a trade publication on biomass for energy, English language journal. It's owned by the Swedish Bioenergy Association, uh, but we're an independent little little group. And you have readers all over we, the world? We have readers all over the globe. Um, the, the, the print magazine has a print run of about 4,000 X, uh, 66 countries, uh, primarily Europe, North America, uh, but also scattered around uh, Southeast Asia. It's a growing market for us. And of course, like you know, most publications, we have a website and that is, I would say, endless. But you didn't. <laughs> Daniel, public affairs, Stora Enso, Stora Enso, this talks a lot about bioenergy and things like that. You probably do a lot too. Tell us about it. Yeah, first of all, thanks for, for being here. And to me, it is actually a bit like being home. I, I, I grew up 45 kilometers from here uh, in Harbo, for mm -hmm. you who know the local. I uh, had my first summer job just at the, the, uh, the conjunction of, of EF4 when I was measuring the, the, uh, the horse trail <laughs> <laughs> that was built there. <laughs> uh, didn't proceed well. Uh, well, the, the horse trail went well, but that was not my. <laughs> nothing to do with my task. Uh, no, but I work at Storanso uh, and public affairs, uh, resp responsible for public affairs, i.e. a lot of discussions with decision makers, uh, not least in Brussels. Uh, and Stora Enso, uh, I guess you, you know us pretty well, uh, but you may not know that we are maybe the oldest shareholding company in the world, mm. uh, with share, share evidence from 1288, so the history goes back to, to uh, Paolo Coppagruva, and then merged uh, with, with Enso uh, in, in around 20 years ago. Yes, we maybe talk a lot about bioenergy, you said that, but we, we look at ourselves as the renewable materials company. So our, our core is really the other parts of the, the bioeconomy. Uh, how do we, everything from printed paper, packaging material, wood construction, new solutions like uh, chemicals, uh, wood, wood fibers for textiles and so forth. Then we have a, a, an important bioenergy uh, part, which uh, in, in Sweden is the largest provider of, of, of uh, solid, uh, solid fuels from wood but we actively do not work with liquid biofuels, which is perhaps important to, to look into and it might be, might be interesting here. But our bioenergy uh, offer is, is big. Uh, it, it's six terawatt hours for you who know terawatt hours. I think that is approximately a nuclear reactor uh, in Sweden, something like that, hmm. primarily, primarily uh, to district heating uh, customers and, and uh, combined, heat and power plant, uh, combined heat and power plants, some internal as well. But our focus is really Everything that you today make from fossil-based uh, materials can be made from renewable materials in the future. So focus on renewable materials. I think it's a good point there, because it's easy sometimes to forget that what we talk about bioenergy is actually rest products from the actual things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you tend to forget that, uh, even when you listen to pol politicians, yeah, they seem yeah. to forget it sometimes. Mm -hmm. let's, so let's come back to that area. Uh, Henrik Södra. Yes. Um, my name is Henrik Dengård and I work at Södra. Uh, Södra is um, uh, owned by 52,000 forest owners. I'm one of them. <laughs> That's very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Probably more people in here, I guess. Yeah. And the purpose of our company <laughs> is to um, ensure the sustainable profitability of your forest farm. Um, and we do that by saying that whatever you want to sell, we will buy. Uh, if you want to sell to someone else, you are free to do that. Um, but we would prefer if you f sold to us. But whenever you want to, buy, uh, to, to sell to us, we will buy everything you have to sell. Um, but in order to make that sustainable, um, we, we have to be able to create value out of everything. So we have uh, six sawmills, uh, and we have three big pulp mills. Um, uh, internally, in those pulp mills, uh, there is circulating uh, 10 terawatt hours of energy. That's amazing. Um, there, that makes us like one quarter of all the black liquor circulation in Sweden. Um, and uh, on top of that, we sell five terawatt hours of uh, solid biofuel in Sweden um, out of perhaps uh, 60 or something. 
Um, yeah. You do some export as well? Um, uh, virtually all of it. Okay. Because um, the, the thing with Sweden is that we have the forest here. Um, the market is in, uh, let's say, in China. Um, but it makes no sense for China to build a big pulp mill because it's too expensive. Um, and you, you, need the, you need land, and it's too expensive where the people are. Uh, so we have a unique possibility to, to make paper pulp and to sell that to, in our case, since we are a standalone pulp mill, we sell it to typically a standalone tissue mill. But they have to be close to their markets um, uh, because y you cannot transport tissue. It's, it's too bulky. But it's, it's very practical to transport pulp. So therefore, um, we are actually looking at an increasing market by 1% to 2% annually. So we are looking to expand our production in all our sites. Um, but that cannot <coughs> go alone. It has to be driven and fuel impaired with the increase of sawn timber. Yeah, exactly. That we were mm. Mm. Let's come back to that, because I know that for the industry it's a key area. You never forget that, that it's actually rest products. I was just... I think we should start with some scientific angle anyway, so we can leave that behind us. Uh, I mean, as an outsider trying to... Interesting outsider within this area, it's easy to be confused. Uh, I mean, the for we need the forest to, to uh, reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so the forest has to be there. It ties um, carbon dioxide in the, f in the woods, in the soil. And, and in the and material which is uh, in that roof. Exactly, and all the material. <laughs> and, and, so, and also it has to do with the quality of the forest in, in order to use it, the transportation, how you do the, the, the transformation. It's so many variables. So it seems like the more you read, it seems like not even the scientists can agree how good this is mm. and what angle we should point. Can we... Can we agree upon something here. I'm, uh, what do you say? You look up... I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that we can agree, but I know my own standpoint. Yeah, what so is say. that? My standpoint is that if we truly believe that we will have a bioeconomy, which most governmental agencies are saying that we should aim for, and the industry is also saying, yes, we are transitioning towards a bioeconomy. In the bioeconomy, just as Henry says, we will replace the fossil products with bio-based products. Then we need to build more in wood. We need to replace the synthetic fibers by bio-based fibers. And in that future, we will also have more residues from the forest and also byproducts, which we need to utilize efficiently in order to maximize the output of the biomass. Because just as you say, of course, it's good. A cultivated forest actually takes up more CO2 mm. than if you just let it grow because when it's had passed like 120 years, it doesn't really take up that much more carbon dioxide anymore. So a cultivated forest can take up more CO2 yeah. as long as you also replant and you have that circle. So if you do that and you have the expanding bioeconomy, then we can do a lot with those bioenergy systems. However, it will not be enough to fully replace all the fossil materials mm -hmm. that we have. And that's the grand challenge, because I always get that question, yeah, but you know, you can't replace everything. Mm -hmm. No, because we have that issue that we use 4.2 Earths of resources. Mm -hmm. So no, we can't replace all that with biomass, but we can replace so much more than we do today. In northern part of Sweden, we use like zero percentage of the forest residues that fall in the forest of the branches and tops w today. Yeah, yeah, first on your land. Uh, but, uh, but I think that's a good point on the topic of, of, of we tend to forget this potential of substitution of, of mm -hmm. products. The, the, I mean, we can't, re as you say, we, we can't, and m maybe we shouldn't aim to replace all fossil fuel materials, but more can be replaced, and more has to be replaced. And if we look at the, the, the research, I, I, th I think it was Skogfors who presented a report pretty recently that said that around 40 million tons of CO2 equivalents are replaced today with sub substitution. Mm. The, total, mm. the total emissions from Sweden is 54 million tons. Mm. So that's where we are today. Mm. And they also claim that the potential al only from Sweden is to, to grow that 40, 40, 40 million tons to 60 million tons. So we can, we can really make a bigger contribution on that. And on top of that, we have the, the, uh, the international demands 
for, for uh, as Henrik uh, t touched upon as well, the international demands on, on more climate-friendly products, uh, more recyclable products, uh, which we tend to forget sometimes that that is a huge demand by consumers, but we have a good position mm. there as well. Growing cities where our wood construction can be part of that. So, so there are a lot of things, as also as you said, Doug, in the beginning, that point towards the potential, and it's not fully utilized yet. Okay. Uh, first, he said Doug. I said Doug. Well, I think I think you <laughs> you hit on an essential point, and it was sort of, it was kind of what I was trying to say in my talk, which is, I think you know the scientific stuff is very important, but we I, I would fault us as an industry or advocates. Sometimes we get kind of lost, and if you lost in the in loose side of the forest for the trees. <laughs> um, you know, we get so caught up in the details and you can kind of sink down in, nobody pays attention to it anymore. And so I think it, it's very important to start talking, and maybe this is more political, but I think even industry has to talk more about some of the very basic points that, you know, people who aren't steeped in this stuff can really understand. Healthy forests are what everybody wants. Trees are good. Trees are trees can be a great resource. We're not going to wipe out forests even if we expand this stuff. There's a, there's a lot of material out there and it will it will be done sustainably. But so but I think that 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 kind of stuff get to the core of the message and the science is is very important. I'm not denigrating that, but you can't kind of lead with that cuz nobody uh, nobody will really understand it. L let me ask you, uh, you you talked a lot about uh, bioenergy potential uh, and also healthy forests, but when it comes to building more as Johanna said building more uh, houses out of woods and things like that, y you know, the primary production. Is that mm -hmm. the debate in the U.S.? In or do, you, do, do you see that uh, as one of the building blocks? Well, actually, you, you ask about conflict. That might be a coming conflict. Is, yeah. um, and there have been, there've been traces of it before where people who rely uh, on trees for wood materials may see this as a threat to their industry, you know, the growing use for fuels and chemicals and power and heat. Um, that might take away the raw materials and drive up prices. Some yeah. people would be upset by that. So it's a it's a complicated market game. Henrik. Yeah, um, and it's important to sort out the uh, the orders of magnitude. I think um, because uh, letting forests grow is great, and we need that. Um, but that will only bind, as Johanna said, material for for a certain time, and then it will flatten out. But if we take material out and build stuff out of it, then that's stored f forever. Um, and then, thanks to that, we can increase the growth rate of the forest. We know that because we've recently bought um, your old uh, forest in Latvia. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, the, growth <laughs> <laughs> the growth of that forest is half of our Swedish forest on a similar soil. The reason that it's only half is because uh, there is no um, value-added industry uh, in the vicinity. So there is no one paying for, for the forest management. So if we take, st because, and, and that leads to, leads to that, uh, there is no one taking the trees out to do stuff with it. And when we do that, which we do in Sweden, then we see that on one hand, and on one hand, we get more material that, that will store carbon and make good use. Every time you take a tree out, the value of that tree will multiply 10 times through the value chain. That's important. And the second thing is, um, apart from that, you will also double the growth rate. That's, that's a, a magic trick, I think. Should we talk about more about fertilizing the woods? And some people argue for that uh, as, as part well, of what you're saying. Also, but there are more easy things to do first. Okay. Um, and uh, the best thing to do is, well, let's use the forest to value adding products mm. that can pay for expensive mm. forest management. And w we know that because 100 years ago, we had um, one piece of forest land uh, and that has doubled. So now we have twice that amount. But during these 100 years, we've taken out four times uh, the... the uh, <laughs> I get confused with my Did fingers. <laughs> <laughs> four times the, um, the initial volume and made a, uh, valuable products that can store carbon through its whole life. That's, that's amazing. Helena. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, th I think sometimes you get a bit confused because you always, when you come with an argument about 
a bioeconomy or uh, bioenergy, you get uh, uh, another argument uh, in return. <laughs> <laughs> Against <laughs> it. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. So <laughs> it's always it's bouncing it's like it's this. A real, it's a real circular thing. It, yeah. it is. Uh, so sometimes you have to, to start with the big picture and say, uh, we don't really have an alternative to a bio-based economy. No. no, you have to, to see that. We don't have an alternative. We have to do this. And we have to think more in circles than in lines. Uh, so far we've been thinking, here we have raw material, and here, here we have the dumpster. But we have to think in circles, like this. So we have to use everything. First make uh, um, timber and build houses or f make furniture. We have to um, um, recycle it a few times. And the last thing you do with it, it's energy. Uh, and uh, we also have to think resource efficiency. And I'd say that raw material is have has a too low value that really drives the resource efficiency. It's too cheap, so you you can you you can uh, you don't have to take every part of it because you you can afford to just throw something yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, I think we should consider ourselves done when it comes to the... I mean, maybe it's the wrong people to ask here. You <laughs> wouldn't be here if you didn't <laughs> believe that this was an important thing. But I think let's clear yeah. and go on. Uh, yeah. I think <laughs> I... I uh, Alan, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you f you're following this around a uh, little bit around the world, the innovation, the scientists. I know you want to say something else here, so uh, I let, no, well, I let uh, you uh, do uh, that. Uh, I see no, that. I, I, <laughs> I, I just want to get back to the, the substitution uh, issue again and, and just sort of put in there um, that it's important that we focus on, on... The issue is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, is it not? The, the, the fossil emissions. One Com issue. Yeah, yeah. And the, the largest source of that is combustion of fossil fuels, including liquid fuels, oil. The amount of oil that's used for, for petrochemicals, for plastics, in other words, carbon that is in some way locked, is the small part. It's six, eight, ten percent maybe of, of total crude oil production. The rest of it, that's what's going up to uh, flu stacks. Mm -hmm. So on, on the substitution note, I just want to, you know, it's important that we focus on the right things. Just, just one thing on that. Yes. What, what we see happen, though, in, 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 the, in the fossil industry is that there is a shift mm -hmm. moving from fossil fuels towards uh, mm -hmm. products and plastic, uh, plastic and petrochemicals. Chem I think that is the largest growing share, if you look at the, the, the recent IEA reports stating that <laughs> the largest growth in, in product categories in, in, in the oil industry is, mm -hmm. is in, in towards petrochemicals. Yeah which to some extent obviously showcase substitution is instrumental. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there, there is a huge potential for that because we need to replace that fossil, uh, fossil fuel. And as you said before, uh, or as it was said before, the, the challenges with, we, we often talk about the challenges with sustainability challenges with, with the bioeconomy, but there are some sustainability challenges with the fossil industry. Exactly. <laughs> we tend to forget yeah. that. We yeah. tend to look into our own challenges mm -hmm. instead of looking out a little mm -hmm. bit. Not saying that we should, bash or, 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 or position ourselves that, but, but we have to also help in, in w what is the discussion really about. Mm. Yep. Uh, mm. I yeah. love yeah. it. Yep. Everyone wants to say mm. something, but I think we should uh, continue. <laughs> <laughs> and let's don't forget the theme today, the, the potential for Sweden, or are we in the forefront? I stated then in my introduction, maybe I was wrong, Douglas mentioned it a little bit, he, you were impressed by Sweden, you said, or something like that. But are we there? Uh, uh, Alan, you're following this uh, yeah. you know, okay. innovations Global, I guess. Are well, we good? I, I, uh, in I, I in what go. parts yeah. are we good? Uh, in what parts are we good? Uh, we are good system thinkers. We're, mm -hmm. we're good in, 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 in thinking in circles. Uh, we're good in... Could be bad. We're good at yeah. what, what I would call cooperation. Mm -hmm. We cooperate mm -hmm. and compete, and that's mm -hmm. not a problem. And to be a little bit more nerdy, what, like... Technical issues are we doing? Uh, 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 is well it well would you say it's a large company that, that are driving this, or is it a smaller no, inno uh, innovator? It, 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 it's both. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, mm. you've, you've got representatives here, for example. If, if I just take, you know, you guys as an example, uh, Stora and so of course has, has operations in, in other countries, in, in Finland, uh, you have operations in, in Russia, in Czech, you know, in, in Europe. Uh, 
you have also have a history of, of cooperating with small companies, um, innovators, uh, for example, lignin extraction, just to take something. Um, likewise, in Söder. Söder is, is a really interesting example uh, which exemplifies what I would call knowing exactly the volume of material coming through the gate, but making more from the same volume. You were talking about energy. You're now exporting electricity to Germany, green certified <coughs> electricity, because you're working with energy efficiency with your own processes, because you realize that there is a value in using as little as possible, re recycling as much of the, the water, the chemicals, But and compared so on. to other huge pulp and paper companies, well, for when example. Was the last, uh, Douglas, maybe you know, when was the last pulp and paper industry built in the US? I don't have that statistic, but no, no, I know but the pulp and paper industry is in decline, yeah, in and they're words, shutting so their doors. I keep reading yeah. about that, so I doubt if there are too many being built yeah. recently. Exactly, and my, which is my point. In, in, in Sweden, we're, we're expanding, we're building new, and mm. in Finland, we're building new ones. Mm -hmm. And in Finland, we're not calling them pulp mills anymore. We're calling them bioproduct mills. Mm. Um, what, to me, is so fascinating is, is even in Russia, there are companies that are emulating, I think in Segeza Group, for example, announced that they are going to be okay. a We are good, we are good. <laughs> Johanna. <laughs> no, I just wanted to add on, on the reason that why, why we are good. Mm. Uh, we have two forest industry companies here, and of course we know that Sweden is full of trees and we're good in the, in the forest industry. But given the bioeconomy and that we say that we want to work with bioenergy and val valuing the bioeconomy, I think that we should highlight that one reason that Sweden is good is that we are this nice little demonstration area. We do not only have pulp and paper industry and forestry, we have agriculture, but we also have chemical process industry quite significant in, in the western part of Sweden. We also have iron and steel industry and we have car manufacturers. So we have a nice little ecosystem of many actors that are significant in the global markets which work in this field. Because as you said previously, you have many applications when you valorize mm -hmm. biomass to bioenergy products. And I would say well, what I wanted to say earlier was that it's not, we should not view it as a competition because the reason why this is not yet reality is that we have residues. And we want to make them to value added products. And those value added products can be used in many different industries. That's the benefit. The challenge is that we do not have the processes in between in commercial scale, how to transform these residues into, into these value-added products that we want in large scale. But when we do, those products that we produce can be used both for transport or in the chemical process industry or in the refineries. So, so to say that it, it's not... Uh, the benefit of Sweden is that we have innovation systems where we have research and development and actually one-of-a-kind demonstration facilities in the world for some technologies. And we have a range of industrial application and industrial actors that actually collaborate mm. over, like Södra, you collaborate with KLM in a project mm. that I'm managing, for example. So you collaborate across not only your own domain. So I would say that's a strength And, and rice Sweden. is the key here in this... Uh, Game, so you said that, yeah. I did that. <laughs> I helped you there. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, just a short follow-up question. Um, you were mentioned that. So you think of all the scientific breakthrough that we might want to see in the future when it comes to this area, maybe it's the transformation from rest products to bioenergy. Somewhere there is the most important. Is that also where you spend your money, put your resources in? Yeah, it's where, where the state puts their resources mm -hmm. and we utilize it together with the companies. Like mm -hmm. to because what you have is lignocellulosic residues. That's waste from forest, but it's also waste from agriculture. And that's hard to convert to like mm. sugars or oils and stuff that you want to use and further transport to fuels or chemicals or materials. And to get that transformation, to convert those lignocellulosic pieces into those sugars or oils and so, that's where we put the emphasis because that is where you need a large scale breakthrough to make that commercial. And that's why we you're still waiting for it, and we are still waiting for it. I was just curi it. curious in the U.S. I mean, the the, I mean, the universities there obviously are, are fantastic, and, and maybe uh, do the research, maybe what they want. Maybe there is not so much connection with the government policies and what they want to see uh, in science. Or is is it? Uh, could you just shortly describe how is it how it looks when it comes to research within this field? Is it s sort of steered from? politicians or is it just growing like flowers or trees? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I, I think sometimes the government likes to think that they're yeah. directing it like that. Um, there've been there's been a heck of a lot of money spent in this field for over 20 years. Um, the government gets taxpayer money. They uh, they put out um, requests for proposals. I mean, I don't want to get too specific here. And mm -hmm. then the national laboratories, companies, uh, universities. They they I think it works best when uh, for for progress when there's collaborative work. You know, it's not just frequently not just universities or not just companies, but they can work together and build up that expertise. Um, I think that's a that's a critical. Uh, that's a critical element in the progress, and I think we always need to keep. Uh, it's easy to kind of get stuck in ruts in, in research and development. I think because uh, we what we see out in the future is kind of what we know now. But there's so many exciting developments out there: biotechnology, artificial intelligence, different <coughs> fields that are coming together in new ways that we haven't anticipated. And I think um, the government can help with that. But they also need um, the government also needs to do things like buy products. Uh, purchase products from the private sector to help grow, um, to help grow these industries, and also I think it's very important to reduce the regulatory barriers. We maybe we don't you don't think about that here in Sweden, but in the United States, government can, no matter what you do, the government can build these these walls that prevent progress, and that's part of what I'm trying to do is knock down those walls. <laughs> so it's it's a mix. It's not, not you can't say one thing over another, but research is clearly important. And complicated, yeah. <laughs> Henrik, we were talking a little bit before, and you said, ah, Sweden, not that good, and you mentioned some other country. I think it was Austria. Maybe that Did was something to me, but now I said it to everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, <Sorry>. um, <laughs> I think um, it, it's very difficult. Sweden is a role model, um, but I wouldn't say it's it's number one. It, it's it's among the best. But um, I would like to say to sort of provoke a little that <laughs> yeah, there are some that are better. Uh, and Austria, I would say, are they are better. Hmm. Um, first, they have um, uh, they managed to create more value out of an even more expensive raw material, and uh, they do that um, by uh, following one simple principle. Well, you always strive for the most value added product. Um, and in their case, they, they don't only make saw and timber, uh, they try to um, increase the value of that product even more um, by doing, for instance, uh, cross laminated timber. We do that as well, but they have, have been doing it for even longer. Uh, that's on the uh, sawmill side and on the pulp mill side, they are not so much into making uh, uh, pulp as we are, um, but instead they, they are, um, they've been in the area uh, to which you are heading, making um, expensive uh, chemicals and um, uh, dissolving pulp, uh, for instance. And, yeah. and that's more value adding, um, uh, value adding corners to be in. And I and I think that's that's when you can afford to um, finance a very expensive forest management, even in Austria, um, which uh, and we want to be there, but even now, um, the um, the energy is in the branches and tops. We only collect around 10 terawatt hours in Sweden. We could easily triple that hmm. without jeopardizing any biodiversity. Wonderful. But the, uh, the obstacle is it's, it's you get about 100 crowns left in your hand when you have sold it, and it costs you 100 crowns to, to collect it. Mm -hmm. So it makes no sense. Mm. Um, and, and we don't have to have a, an increase in, uh, in growth rate or in production. It's there already. It's just uh, too low value to yeah. fetch yeah. right now. You said Daniel? No, just also a reflection on, on uh, the state of Sweden. And I agree, I think we are in a good position, but also Austria, I mean, we have presence there with, with some of these uh, cross-laminated timber factories. And by the way, we inaugurated one here in, in outside Karlstad just, mm. uh, just some 10 days ago, showcasing that this industry is mm. getting stronger and stronger here as well. But besides Austria, uh, we, we, we need to mention Finland, <laughs> I think, <laughs> our other home, home country, which is mm. really targeted. They have a strong bioeconomy mm. agenda, uh, mm. strong political uh, gathering around that. And I think that is something that mm. we are lacking a bit in Sweden yeah. still. 
a lot of politicians talk about the green gold, mm -hmm. but there is a challenge to fully gather around the, the, the bioeconomy agenda. Actually, mm -hmm. we, we have a good position, but more c the potential is not fully utilized, but, I but would say. Let's try to be a little bit more concrete and specific. What, what, where is the potential? Is it in exporting uh, products, that, uh, wood products that can replace other products? Is it the know-how to do the transformation to bioenergy? Is it the export of pellets and biscuits and other things? Or wh what, what do you think, uh, uh, Alan? Uh, all of the above except perhaps uh, much pellet export. There's, there's, there's trade to and fro on, on that, but the, the volumes aren't. aren't Aren't, aren't enormous. But other than that, it, it's technology, it's, it's know-how, it's, it's, it's like a call a cooperation. You, you cooperate with some, you compete with others. Um, definitely Finland, but it's also bilateral with, with, with Canada, I believe, mm. with, with, with the US, um, with, with South Africa, with Japan. Uh, so it's, it's imagination. Yeah, yeah I, I would just like to add, because it's quite clear that one potential is the value added that we would get from the resources that are grown here, so a net exporting possibility. But what's often forgotten is the, that if we do not commercialize and scale up the technologies for conversion of biomass here, we lose the connection. Because mm -hmm. we can see, as it, just as one example, the research institute where I work was part of developing the Lignobost technology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're still actively working with that. But when you have commercial applications outside Sweden, we are not as active mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. like uh, troubleshooting and helping out and mm -hmm. building on that innovation anymore, comparing to when we have scale up and development within Sweden, because otherwise it will be, of course, mm -hmm. then Finnish active VTT are also <laughs> good researchers, so mm -hmm. to say. Mm -hmm. So I would say for, for, for Sweden as a company, uh, not just the possibility of an added net export, but also the possibility to utilize and build on that knowledge, mm. those governmental funding money that we have had for technology yeah. development. Mm. Because if we scale up that technology too far away from here, it will be much harder for us to maintain that high level of knowledge. And not just export, I think look to build factories build facilities in other, <laughs> other countries, you know, okay. look for the markets that are growing, and oh. that's hard, but uh, to start to build roots in, in other countries, too. Yeah. U.S., for example. Like U.S., for example, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that is uh, an area where Sweden has been historically weak. We, we are very strong in um, uh, this elemental research, and, and we finance that heavily, but there is a gap when it comes to scale-up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, where is it a lack of capital, maybe, or...? Uh, uh, no, it's directed in capital? the wrong direction. Okay. Uh, I think that it's... Um, Bro wrong science? science? Um, no. Uh, I, I can only conclude that uh, there is a lack of financing for scale-up projects. But I can answer. Okay. I can say that <laughs> <laughs> we, we have looked at that. And with the, you can take the example of the bi biofuels uh, sector or the transport sector in Sweden. And we can say that we are leading, like we have 20% biofuels in the Swedish transport sector. If we count like EU-wise, we have 32, 36. We're mm. way ahead. Mm. Even in absolute numbers, we're just below France and Germany. And we have, you can say we have developed a market, but we only have like a production of six to seven terawatt hours within Sweden, the rest is import. Mm -hmm. And the thing mm -hmm. is that wha what we can say is that we have been really good, but we have focused on policies for market development. Mm -hmm. And market policies for market development is not the same as for production. And it's not the same, it's when you have that competition, you get the cheapest stuff on the shelf, you do not get innovation. So it's a difference mm -hmm. if you want to stimulate markets or if you want to stimulate industrial development mm -hmm. and scale up. And I think that that is something that has not been recognized enough in the Swedish policy setting. Okay. We have thought that if we just create the markets, it will do. Itself, yeah. it will, uh, well, we, it we see upon us ourselves that um, uh, we go into a, an economy that um, um, should be driven by, by knowledge, not by industrial investments. But it comes together, I'd say. You have to have the the production to keep the knowledge okay. and vice versa. We, we like to think that we can only sit in a yeah. clean room and do mm. everything <laughs> without the production, sort of. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, Daniel. Uh, but, but just on, on uh, we shouldn't forget that we uh, the, the export, the amount of exports already today. I yeah. mean, we are provide. We, we sometimes we tend to to, to look into these uh, future prospects and so forth. But but if we look at the, the size of, of export from forest industry today, it is it is pretty big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're talking eight eighty five percent or something generally. Uh, we are completely dependent on what happens on international markets. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have to continue drive the innovation agenda here at home. We have to be better. But, but if there are changes on international markets, uh, that, that perception around forestry, that, that there is a huge sustainability discussion uh, that we do not, for some reason, uh, manage to, to respond to fully, that will be a huge challenge. Would you say we forget that, that we tend to yeah. focus too much on the basic scientists, and, and you do a lot of research and development too, yeah. such as other no, but multinationals. I, I think sometimes we tend a lot to of happening there. I think in the national debate, sometimes we tend to, for, to forget to understand how important it is to get offset for, for what we already do. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think the EU, the EU discussions is one very good example yes, where, exactly. where the other countries do not have the same, for natural reasons, do not have the same uh, knowledge about around forestry, and they have concerns. But, and, 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 mm. and, and they have concerns with how forestry is run in Europe, but also outside Europe. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to be able to respond to that in a credible way, showcase that, that biodiversity is high on our agenda, that we do not de uh, that, that our forests regrow. We need to communicate those things. I mean, one very hands-on exam example, I think, I, maybe you've been to Växjö and Trumman Strand, is one of the Nordic's largest uh, wood construction sites, 6,300 uh, cubic meters of CLT. The material for that grows back in 20 minutes, <laughs> a summer day. <laughs> it takes 20 minutes. That's the, kind of <laughs> that's the kind of message that I think we need to talk about. Uh, that and in other Europe. countries as well. And outside Sweden, yeah. 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 Uh, I'm going to let you um, ask some questions soon. Uh, we're going to end up with some questions for the audience. I'm just curious. We, I think we should also go into some the broad picture of Swedish policy. Uh, if we get a lot of... Uh, uh, what do you say, Biram? I, 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 I credit. Credit, credit yeah. for, for being innovative and good companies. We also sometimes get a lot of credit for the policies uh, along forestry, a very long-term view. I mean, we're able to grow more trees than we chop down. We've been able to grow our timber industry, still uh, growing the tree covers totally. So it's quite amazing. I know many are impressed. Uh, you're not politicians, but you, you, you'll be the politicians here today. Do, do okay. you <laughs> should we be proud over that? Is it any weaknesses? Uh, uh, do we tend to forget uh, what's created this? And uh, is it in danger, uh, this successful? Um, yes, it's a big discussion, even in Sweden, um, um, about biodiversity and how we manage our forests. Exactly. And um, uh, so I'd say that we should be very proud of the way we have managed Sweden's forests. I mean, we have a, a lot of private uh, forest owners. Uh, most of the forests are private owned. Uh, and um, that, that uh, is a guarantee for that everyone doesn't manage the forest exactly the same. And I think that's a strength. Uh, because it's it varies the risk. You said you shouldn't put but all your eggs in. But is there any danger in the debate yes, yes, now I that the, the forest has to be where they are? They have to tie more yeah, carbon I'd dioxide. I'd say that it's, it's sort uh, of tipping on the other direction. Yes, I'd, I'd say it's uh, it's very hard to preserve or conserve forests and think that you also can go into a, a bio-based economy. You have to think in uh, in a new way. You have to be able to produce both timber and um, biomass, and also uh, bio bio biological uh, values. And are we missing that something? Uh, I think the discussion is uh, is mm. Uh, mm. is like this. You agree? You don't yeah, mean yeah. You yeah. recognize yeah. that yeah, from yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, yeah. So we bang <laughs> uh, arguments in, in uh, the head of the, the other party. Mm. We don't meet uh, because we don't know enough. I'd, I'd say that uh, uh, the awareness is so big in the public about climate change, yeah. but uh, they don't always draw the right conclusions. This, the scarcity makes us not thinking, mm. sort of. Okay. But you recognize this from US, you said. 
Yeah, I think, I think sometimes um, supporters of the bioeconomy, um, they know the facts, they, they, they've talked about it, but I think they're a little reluctant to engage in the, uh, in the free-for-all and the public debate, you know, maybe, maybe a little fearful of where that might lead and what might happen, but I think we, we shouldn't shy away from engaging in a debate like that because it's, uh, if you don't, then people who don't or are not supportive of the bioeconomy sort of set the agenda and set the public's mind about how they think about this. You, you, you can get lost in all the details. I, I've sometimes thought about writing an article about the myths, M-Y-T-H, the myths of bioenergy, you know, the things that confuse people, because there's many, many, if you talk to people, the, the you know, I think it's in America anyway, that it's, it's gotten to the point where many people see bioenergy as a big negative. It's kind of hard for mm -hmm. us, people like us up here, to see that, but there are people, and there's not a few of them, um, who think bioenergy is a bad thing. I mean, I'm, On I'm, what grounds? I'm all kinds of grounds, you okay. know, that the, uh, it's not sustainable, it, you know, uh, it's damaging yeah. to the environment, it's damaging mm -hmm. to people, it's wasteful, it's old, it's boring, it's oh. not sexy, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I, that's, that's, that's my, list, yeah, that's my list of myths. Yeah. You know? But, but yeah. sometimes uh, we also think that bio-based uh, bio economy is all good. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not it, it, yeah, it, yeah. it has to be combined with resource efficiency because we have to grow what we eat, <laughs> so to speak. But more wooden houses, you described. That must be so easy to understand. We chop mm -hmm. down trees, we build, st st still ties a lot of uh, <laughs> carbon yeah. dioxide, mm -hmm. and it's new. Wh what can you not understand by that? No, but I, I don't think the wood, wood construction side is no, the difficult part. No, 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 I think, no, they, as, as they I said, it is easy to understand. The, so yeah. the, the challenging part is the understanding that that, that is the driving that yeah. is the driving force for the whole system. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it's that the rest products. Mm -hmm. Exactly, the second tier goes to paper pulp mm -hmm. uh, and, and packaging materials and stuff like that. Third part goes to bioenergy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the difficult yeah. part to understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. But that's the interesting which we, part Which we try to advocate. Johanna. Yeah, it's the interesting part saying that that's what drives it. But we don't discuss if we should build wooden houses or not, because mm -hmm. it's so clear that, of course, we should, and we mm -hmm. should build more, and we should try mm -hmm. to change regulatory frameworks mm -hmm. to build high and mm -hmm. dense houses. Mm -hmm. And we don't argue that we should do, like, paper and mm -hmm. uh, the sanity products that exactly. we use. But we argue if we should use the residues that fall automatically when we do this other stuff. <laughs> that we argue if yeah. should mm -hmm. we should utilize yeah. those residues. <laughs> mm. Is that sustainable or not to utilize those residues from all these other products that we do not argue if we should use? And they will oxidize even if we do not collect them. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's a one interesting argument. When we start argument. here in two years, we have to bring some of these people so we get the really <laughs> hot <laughs> uh, debate, I would say. think we should it's say. It's, yeah. it's the double paradox that we have to mm. explain. Uh, the uh -oh, paradox of, of using more wood, <laughs> i.e. increasing consumption, mm. building uh, massive you know, CLT houses, using more, cutting down more trees, using more wood, at the same time using residues, com using them for, for combustion purposes, either as liquid or solid or gaseous fuels, which emits carbon dioxide, which is the problem in the first place. That is one of the yeah. key issues we, we, we need to get, get across, the, the difference between... And leave behind the, us, maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, we'd never get it behind us. Oh. Uh, there'll always be people, and I think it's going to get worse uh, for the simple reason more and more people are living in the urbanized world and have lost daily contact That's with agriculture, with forestry, uh, mm. think that milk comes in, in Tetra Pak, <laughs> i.e. a bio-based product, all the same, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, don't know what a cow is. Do we have any questions from the audience? You can raise your hand and I'll um, repeat the uh, question to, to the audience. Um, if not, uh, think... Uh, I was thinking, yeah, yeah, I was just curious. Sorry, I'm jumping a little bit back here. Johanna, y you said that the transformation from rust products to bioenergy is one key area for you to put money on. Do you see any other key areas that are really important when it comes to scientific breakthroughs here in the future in order to boost uh, development? I would say that that is the, the scientific breakthrough, but then again, it, it's not one technology, it's a, a number okay. of different technologies. You can say that you have biochemical pathways, you have thermochemical pathways, and then you also have the lignin track where you like utilize lignin from either biochemical platforms or from the pulp mills. So you have, it's, it's, not, it's one area, but it's many different technological breakthroughs that we need. So I would say that that, that is, for
for, for me as a research institute and as a researcher, I would say that's, that's the main thing. But to get that done, because we are fairly far, some of these technologies have been demonstrated in near industrial scale. So it's not research mainly that we need. We also need mm. uh, policy uh, to help get us those first commercial scale plants to get the, the stuff going. I'm going to try to round up here, but let's not forget the, the overall theme here today, the Swedish potential when it comes to bioenergy and, of course, so, so wooden products. Uh, let's summarize this. 30 seconds east. Where is the potential, Henrik? Um, the potential is in uh, uh, collecting uh, more of the residues so that we can create value out of all parts of the tree. And that is, I would say, just by doing what we already are able to do today is actually double the potential for bioenergy than if we would increase the growth rate uh, of, uh, of our target. So uh, doing the easy stuff first is the biggest potential. Daniel, the industry uh, perspective? Yeah, f I think keep on focusing on innovation and remembering that innovation will never happen in isolation. Uh, to find these new solutions, we as big companies need to cooperate with, with startups, industry associations, uh, the, the whole community, and understand also what consumers are asking for. I think that is, that is one of the key. I mean, one very hands-on example is, these, the, the, we mentioned the plastic debate. Uh, huge market potential to replace single-use plastics. Mm -hmm. uh, together with, with Sulapak, a small startup, we launched a straw. Uh, which is which is a potential alternative to to the traditional single fossil based plastic we would never have come up to with that without working close to a small startup company so i think that is there is a huge potential and keep on searching for the innovations mm -hmm. and elmia wood is a great place of meeting each other of course yeah of course lotta <laughs> lotta <laughs> nods her head alan well for me my my perspective is is, is having a more holistic view on things in other words, not being so singular in, in, in thinking. You know, is it going to be a fuel or is it going to be... It's, you know, all of the above. It's, it's systems. It's, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. In a good way, yeah. 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 <laughs> Helena? Uh, I think we have a, a lot of things that we can do more with. We have the biomass. Uh, we have the technology. We have the know-how. It can always be better. All of that can be better, We've, but we have a lot of it. We also have the awareness uh, of, of the, uh, the public. Uh, so I'd say what we have to do is to have a long-term policy that people who want to invest in this uh, dare to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and reward the ones who, who uh, really take brave steps because we have a track record backwards that you get a bit punished if you... But they're rewarded yeah. in uh, profit, ho hopefully. Yes, yeah. in profit, <laughs> yes. Send them the first but ones, no. but the second and third. And, yeah. and uh, mm. th that's the, an important uh, issue, that the first one, that really is the bold one who goes uh, forward, they take the big risk and they are left alone. Uh, if the polit um, politics change, if, uh, mm. if the... Uh, so I'd say we have to re reward the ones, uh, not only the ones who do the right thing, but also the ones who try to do something or good. Or daring, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I would say that uh, for me, I think what w we actually need to focus more on is both collaboration, and collaboration then broad and cross-sectorial and cross-cutting in all ways, and also communication. And in both these areas, I think that we need to do th two things. And then one is to actually dare to simplify because we need to get the mm. message through. And I hate mm. to do that. Our communication <laughs> people always say that you, if you feel it's wrong, it's then it, you're communicating the right way because it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, as, a, as a researcher, and this area is complicated, it's really, really hard. So I say we, we have to dare to simplify a bit. Uh, and then we also have to dare to take the hard discussions. Because just as you say, it's not, if it was easy, it would have been done. It's because it's hard, it's fun, but it's also, uh, it's complicated. <laughs> so, but to dare to take those discussions which are not only easy. Doug, you get the first word oh, and the last word. First and the last, okay. Mm -hmm. If I had one thing to leave with an audience, and I try to always leave with 
One thing is that if the world is serious about solving a number of problems, we need bioenergy more than ever. But we need a lot more of it, and we need it faster. That's really the question for me. How do we do that? Thank you very much, and applaud for the <laughs> panel and an interesting discussion. Uh, while the panel gets flowers, I want to inform you that uh, Elmia now invites you all to stay here to eat something. Uh, I've seen already uh, some food over there. And uh, thank you very much for coming here. I thought it was very interesting. I hope you thought the same. Thank you.